the Eastern Roman Empire bet everything on the skilled commander Romanos, but his defeat and capture at the Battle of Manzikert signaled the start of a new crisis. That same year, the last stronghold in southern Italy fell to the Normans, led by Robert Giscard, leaving the Byzantines surrounded by enemies. But there was one man determined to preserve the empire no matter the cost, Alexios Komnenos. This is the story of the events preceding the First Crusade, which are often ignored. Welcome to our video on the Battle of Calavriae. These medieval armies needed serious steel gear to survive, and in Japan the techniques learned can still be seen today in the Japanese steel kitchen knives produced by our sponsor Kamikoto. They utilize 800 years of traditional techniques to handcraft knives using exclusively high quality Japanese steel and a stunning satin finish delivered in a beautiful heavy duty ash wood box, ideal for presenting as a gift. All knives in Kamikoto's range are individually inspected after a several year long production process, and they're so confident in the result that they offer a lifetime guarantee. Their single bevel edge is unbelievably sharp, more than other knives can achieve, and you can keep it that way with one of Kamikoto's sharpening whetstones. Kamikoto knives are used by several chefs working at Michelin star restaurants. We might not be that good, but we can see why. The blades they sent us were perfectly balanced, easy and comfortable to use, and cut through everything we ever wanted. Get these blades with a discount by going to kamikoto.com kings and using our code kings. That will give you 50 US dollars off any purchase that you make. Following the humiliating defeat at the hands of Alparslan, the Eastern Roman Empire was given generous terms and could still field a massive army, which was well trained and equipped. However, the court in Constantinople rejected the terms and waged a short but costly civil war against Romanos. His stepson, Michael VII, now sat on the throne, but behind the scene, various noble families were competing for power and titles as the state crumbled. The young emperor would eventually earn the nickname Paripinekis, or minus a quarter, for the debasement of the currency Solidus, which now contained only 58% gold, with the remainder being made up of silver and copper. This meant that the buying power of the currency dropped, which in turn crippled the economy, and when Michael raised taxes, there was an immediate response from the Balkans. In general, the sources claim that the 21-year-old emperor was a mere puppet, ruled by different courtiers at different periods, and was only interested in hunting and feasts. Bulgarian rebels, supported by Serbia, raised a pretender, Konstantin Bodin, in 1072, who took Skopje and defeated the Strategos of the Bulgarian theme. Nish and Ored quickly fell, before the empire could organize a response. The rebels were crushed at Castoria, but it would take time until 1073 until the remnants were dealt with. Not only did this cost the empire crucial time, but it meant that they couldn't launch a full-scale counterattack to the east, as a large portion of its professional army, or Tachmeta, was busy in the Balkans. The compromise was to send a smaller force, under the command of Isaac Komnenos, along with his younger brother, Alexios, leading a tenth of what Romanos gathered two years earlier. Accompanying them was a cavalry force of 400 Frankish mercenaries, headed by the Norman Roussel de Bayeux, who was present at Manzikert. By this point, the Seljuks had already broken the eastern defences and roamed the Anatolian plateau unopposed, but the coastline was secure as well as any city with stone walls, so the region was far from being lost, and this expeditionary force was crucial in asserting dominance over the nomads. The imperial army assembled in the area of Caesarea, where a serious incident drove a wedge between the Byzantines and their mercenaries. After Isaac punished a Frankish soldier, the insulted Norman leader took his men and fled during the night. Upon hearing this news, the Byzantine commander considered sending Alexios to track them down, but that was when he was informed that a Seljuk force was approaching their position. The two armies met near Cappadocia, and after a failed ambush, Isaac was wounded and captured, while Alexios barely escaped. Some of the fleeing soldiers were rejected from the nearby cities, 
who were afraid the Seljuks were close behind. Meanwhile, Roussel managed to defeat a different group of nomads and seize the town of Ankara, where he proclaimed himself a prince and founded his own state. The news shocked the emperor, who responded by sending his uncle, John Ducas, with a considerable force to deal with the adventurer. Of the 12,000 strong army, many were fresh recruits, with some veterans from Manzikert, as well as 1,500 Varangians and 500 Franks. Once Roussel learned that the army crossed the Bosphorus, he gathered his own 3,000 men, most of whom were knights. The two armies met on the 10th of May 1074 on the bridge of the Sangarios River, not far from Amorium, which was the Norman power base. The Romans offered amnesty to the adventurer, but their offer was rejected. That is when, rather than waiting for reinforcements from the nearby cities, the inexperienced John Ducas ordered his men to charge across the river. The Byzantines were now in a very precarious position, with the river at their back and the Norman army in front. The three divisions were arranged in two lines, with the right flank led by the Franks, while John held the center with his Varangians, his son Andronikos was on the left, with the governor of the Anatolic theme, Nikiforos Vortaniates, in charge of the rearguard, composed of the levies. In the early hours of the next day, Roussel rode towards the Frankish line and addressed the men, urging them to defect, which they did. Together, the two groups pushed against the Roman center. As the battle raged on between the most elite troops on the field, Nikiforos Vataniates panicked and ordered a retreat, taking half the army to his estates. Seeing this, many began to surrender or retreat, and before long the battle was over. John Ducas was captured alongside his son Andronikos, who now contemplated the irony as three years ago he was in charge of the rearguard and abandoned Romanos at Manzikert. A new army was quickly gathered under the command of his other son Constantine, but shortly after crossing to release his family, he died, and another expedition disintegrated, leading to nothing but debt. Roussel decided to make another gamble by proclaiming the captured John Ducas as the new emperor. This was the pivotal moment when desperation forced the Roman hand to choose the lesser evil. After losing his bid for the Seljuk throne against Alparslan, Suleiman and his three brothers fled to the Taurus Mountains back in 1064, and he became the sole survivor after multiple punitive raids. Now that Melik Shah I ruled the Seljuk Empire, which was weakening, Suleiman managed to establish himself in the region, which had the exact same climate conditions as the steppe, but was detached from the authority of Isfahan. The nomads raided, but also traded with the local Byzantines, who were themselves cut off from Constantinople, when suddenly Suleiman received an offer which would not only make him an ally of the empire, but also formalize his territorial claims and fill his pockets. All he had to do was deal with Roussel, who just sacked Chrysopolis near Constantinople. The Norman finally met his match as he fell for the classic feigned retreat and was captured by the Seljuks. But before Constantinople could send their ransom, his wife showed up with a generous amount of gold and the Seljuks released him. Desperation really kicked in and Michael used his connection to Georgia via his wife Maria to convince Tsar George II to hold the eastern frontier and capture Roussel in return for Theodosiopolis, Tau and Kars. The crucial cities and forts were handed over, but the Georgian army failed with many joining the Norman cause. All seemed lost, but the Byzantines were well aware that if this was not handled quickly, rebellions would erupt elsewhere, proclaiming John as their rightful leader. The next candidate to step up to the job was Alexios Komnenos, a 20-year-old energetic and charismatic man who was appointed commander-in-chief and sent to deal with Roussel without any significant funds or army. Unrelenting, the young man used his cunning and appealed to the Seljuks, promising them riches if they would capture the prince. The nomads agreed and once again accomplished their task by inviting the wanted man to a feast and betraying him. 
Rusel was brought to the city of Amasya, but the problem was that Alexios didn't have the funds he promised, so he turned to the local populace. Surprisingly, the locals preferred the Norman garrison and grew fond of their prince, who, unlike the empire, protected them from Turkic raids. In order to convince them, Alexios blindfolded Roussel and announced that he was blinded and was in no condition to defend them anymore. This plan worked, and after gathering the funds and paying the Seljuks, Alexios returned to Constantinople victorious and locked him in a dungeon in 1076. This is a good point to shift to the other side of our narrative, as in 1076, the growing tensions between Pope Gregory VII and Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV erupted into what is now known as the Investiture Controversy. The boundaries between the imperial and papal authority were always blurred, but Gregory was an overly ambitious and influential pope who reformed the church, enforcing celibacy for the clergy and preached the idea of an organized papal army led by the pontiff. On one occasion he wanted to lead an expedition into Al-Andalus, on another to aid the Eastern Roman Empire in retaking their lost lands, provided they accept the primacy of the Catholic Church, before that force retook the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. While these ideas sound familiar now, back then it was unheard of for a pope to wield that much power or even lead his own army. Already the seed of future events was planted in a combination of the desperate Byzantine leadership asking for aid from the West and the desire for increased power for the papacy. Agents were sent throughout Europe, exaggerating reports of violent barbarians, defiling and harassing innocent pilgrims, despite the fact that since the Islamic conquest of the Holy Lands, thousands of pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem. Initially, the preferred route was to go to a maritime city, chiefly Venice, and then sail for two weeks. But over time, the difficult naval trip was made worse by Arab pirates and became less used than the land route. One could travel to Constantinople by land or sea, then take the Roman roads, enjoying the hospitality in this medieval version of tourism, which the Normans, Seljuks and general instability made worse. But the stars were not yet aligned for one of the most pivotal changes in history to occur. It would take a different pope and different Eastern Roman Emperor for these ideas to coalesce. Back in Byzantium, the idea of handing out money to solve all of their problems was expanded upon, with the alliance with Hungary and the Normans. In fact, Robert Giscard was paid a large amount of gold and given 40 titles to bestow upon his followers, each acting as an annual salary. But above all, his daughter was betrothed to the son of the emperor. The idea behind this expensive endeavor was to ensure nominal control over southern Italy as well as buy time for the state to recover. All of this money had to come from somewhere, so a reform was passed aiming to centralize the grain trade. Until this moment, farmers sold their produce to merchants, who then sold the grain to the populace at a competitive price. But in these troubled times, tax evasion was widespread. The solution was to concentrate the entire grain trade to one city, Redestos, where the price would be the same and each transaction much easier to tax. The immediate aftermath of this policy saw farmers withholding their grain in order to create a shortage, which would then raise the prices. The overcrowded city of Constantinople, filled with refugees from all the lands in Anatolia now given to the Seljuk allies, began to starve, which led to an uprising. Emperor Michael managed to quell it, but the problems were just starting, as this rebellion led to civil war. Usually civil wars involved two sides, however in this scenario there were four separate rebellions, each with its own goal. First, there was Philaretos Frachamios, who carved out a very large piece of the empire, centered around Antioch, after the Battle of Manzikert. He proclaimed himself emperor and slowly expanded his realm by attacking other Roman cities. Secondly, a federation of cities on the Danube River broke off and sided with the nomadic Pechenegs. In November 1077, the most powerful man in the Balkans, governor of the Derachio theme, 
Nikephoros Vrienios, also proclaimed himself emperor and gathered a coalition of supporters filled with veteran soldiers, as he himself was a capable commander. Lastly, we have Nikephoros Pataniates, the 76-year-old governor of the Antolikon theme, with very few supporters or credentials, who rebelled in October 1078. Vrenios took action, and after taking over much of the western territories, marched on Constantinople, hoping the people would embrace him, but after he was rejected, he raided the suburbs. Pechenek riders also rode south, hoping to plunder some villages, forcing the pretender to pull back. In the meantime, Vitanietes was well aware that he could not take the city on his own, so he pushed the next domino in our story by hiring Seljuk mercenaries. After he took Nicaea, he stationed many of them as garrison forces in western Anatolia, including key cities like Pergamon, Ephesus and Sardis, cities these steppe raiders could hardly take on their own, with the assumption that the moment he asked for them to leave, they would follow his command. Back in Constantinople, the aristocracy knew they had to pick a side, so they chose not based on merit, but on how easy it would be to control the next ruler. The city rebelled, forcing Michael to abdicate, and Vortaniates was invited to take the throne, which he did as Nikiforos III. The new emperor made a deal with the wife of Michael, Maria. She married him in exchange for the recognition of her child, Constantine Ducas, as the heir to the throne. Nikiforos III then proceeded to hand out the customary gifts and titles, but doubled down by forgiving all debt and expanding various rights to secure the rule of his new dynasty. One of those titles was that of Caesar, or second-in-command, which was offered to Vrenios, but was rejected. Frahamios, on the other hand, agreed to accept him as emperor, in return for control over his territory, stretching between the key cities of Antioch, Melitini, and Edessa. However, the rebellions didn't die out, and Vrenios was able to take over most of the Balkans, forcing Nikiforos III to appoint Alexios to crush him. It was 1078, and Alexios marched west with an army between 5,000 and 10,000 troops strong, 2,000 of which were Seljuk cavalry, 2,000 Khometeni, or elite infantrymen, a few hundred Frankish knights, and a newly raised regiment of Athanity, or immortals, with the remainder made up of newly raised levies. The rebel army was not only more numerous, composed of 12,000 seasoned warriors, a mixture of Tachmeta, Slavic, Pecheneg and Frankish mercenaries, but was also led by a more experienced commander. Alexios made camp on a shore of a small stream near the fortress of Calavrie, but he didn't fortify his camp as a sign of strength. He quickly sent out Seljuk scouts, learning the location and size of the enemy force, but some of the scouts got captured, and that exposed his own position. Vrienios knew that he had his opponent outnumbered, so he marched his army for the decisive battle. Alexios was on the defence, and held his left flank with his immortals. The centre was made up of Franks, while the right, under the command of Constantine Katakalon, was made up of the Khometeni and Seljuks. The Turks made up an extreme right wing, ready to counteract the enemy Pechenegs, with another smaller detachment on the far left, positioned within a hollow, concealed from the enemy. Vrenios had deployed his army in three divisions, each in two lines, with Pecheneg cavalry to his far left. The right wing consisted of a 5,000-strong unit, bolstered by Frankish knights and Thessalian cavalry, under his brother John. His left was made up of 4,000 troops from Thrace and Macedonia, while he led the 4,000-strong center. As the rebels approached, the ace Alexios hid was sprung, and the powerful wing under John was caught between the immortals led by Alexios and those lying in ambush, who were now rushing towards the battle with war cries. The rebels panicked, but after cutting down one of his enemies, Vrienios rallied his men, halting their rout and urging them back into the fray. Despite his best efforts, Alexios, who was in the midst of the battle slashing with his sword, saw his men break and flee as they were chased and cut down. 
Meanwhile, on the right, the Pechenegs managed to evade the Seljuk riders and overwhelmed the right wing. In the center, Nikiforos persuaded the Franks to desert the Loyalists, as they swore fealty to him in the middle of the battle. All seemed lost, so Alexios gathered six of his companions and charged into the enemy line, hoping to kill the usurper and end the war. It was aided by the sudden decision of the Pechenek riders to turn back and rush toward the camp of their allies. They took as much loot as they could, while the camp followers ran to the safety of the rearguard. Part of Frenios's army was celebrating, while others were running, and it was in this atmosphere of utter confusion that Alexios spotted the purple-clothed royal horse with both swords of state to its side. He immediately rushed in, killed some retainers, and rode off with it back to his camp. Once he arrived, he found the remnants of his now shattered army and began lifting their spirits, spreading the rumor that the enemy commander was dead as he rode atop his horse. At that very moment, an extra contingent of Seljuk horse archers made their way to the camp, just in time for the counterattack the loyalists were about to launch on the unsuspecting enemy. The reformed army was once again divided in three, with two detachments lying in ambush, while the third, a mix of Seljuks and Immortals, planned to execute the classic but extremely difficult feigned retreat. Multiple small groups of nomads fired their arrows at the rebels, scattering many of them. Next, the heavy cavalry charged in. One of the riders spotted Frenios, and according to the Alexiad, dashed at full gallop straight at Frenius, and thrust his spear with great violence against the latter's breast. Frenius, for his part, whipped his sword out quickly from its sheath, and before the spear could be driven home, he cut it in two and struck his adversary on the collarbone, and bringing down the blow with the whole power of his arm, cut away the man's whole arm, breastplate included. After a while, Alexios ordered the retreat, hoping it wouldn't turn into a rout as the veterans gave chase. Again, according to the Alexiad, forthwith at the given signal, those in ambush rode through them like swarms of wasps from various directions, and with their loud war cries and shouts and incessant shooting, not only filled the ears of Renius's men with a terrible din, but also utterly obscured their sight by showering arrows upon them from all sides. The bold plan had worked, and before long, the rebel leader was exhausted, and despite his best efforts, the day belonged to Alexios Komnenos. Vrienios was blinded, but pardoned and allowed to return to Adrianople. As for the victorious general, he was not allowed back into the capital, and instead was sent out against a new pretender, Nikiforos Vasilakis, who rose up in Thessaloniki, attracting many of the remaining rebels. But one night attack later, this rebellion was also put down. It was now 1080, and the gold content of the Solidus fell to 33%, as the fourth Nikiforos rose up in rebellion. This time it was Melissinos who rebelled with the aid of Suleiman. By that point, Suleiman received the title of the Sultan of Rum from the Sultan Melik Shah. In return for Suleiman's support, Melissinos opened the gates of Nicaea, which fell to the hands of the Sultanate of Rum, once again without a fight. Alexios was ordered to deal with the man who happened to be his brother-in-law, but this time he refused. No action was taken against him, since news reached the capital that Robert Giscard was planning to launch a massive invasion, after a monk impersonating Michael VII appealed to him to take back his throne and Alexios was needed to stop that incursion. And it was right around this time that the old and childless Nikephoros III decided to break the agreement he made with Maria, and appointed one of his relatives the heir, alienating the Komneni family which joined the rebels. In April 1081, a band of German mercenaries was bribed and opened the gates of Constantinople to Alexios and his army, which proceeded to brutally sack the city. The Varangian guard continued to defend the palace, but three days later, the Patriarch convinced the now 79-year-old Emperor to abdicate. Alexios I Komnenos became the Emperor. 
while we now tend to think of Alexios as a capable ruler, at the time of his coronation, the Sultanate of Rum was handed most of Anatolia and supported another pretender to the throne, a usurper. The Normans were about to invade, control over Serbia and Bulgaria was nominal, the alliance of the Danubian cities was in rebellion, supported by the Pechenegs, the treasury was empty, the manpower was depleted, and the Solidus fell to 10% gold content. No man alive could unify the bickering families and hold the empire together while also campaigning against this many enemies. But Alexios's mother, Anna Dalassini, was no man. Alexios's mother not only played a pivotal role in his rebellion, but was the real power behind the administration for the next 15 years, second only to her son. She arranged marriage alliances and delicately balanced the power between the most powerful people in the empire. The previous approach of purging political opponents was abandoned and replaced with mercy and amnesty. Many old titles were discarded, and instead new ones were created. Nikephoros Melissinos was pardoned and made Caesar, as well as the governor of Thessaloniki. The extended Komnenos family was given important posts. Precious gifts were sent to the Pope, Doge, Holy Roman Emperor, and various Italian lords, while Alexios mustered an army to meet Rebe Giscar. You can check out the two videos we made covering the conflict, including the Battle of Dyrrhachium, which was as devastating as Manzikert, via the link in the description and in the top right corner. Despite numerous setbacks, Alexios and his coalition held out long enough until Giscard died of malaria in 1085. But in order to repay the Venetian allies who made this victory possible, Alexios made considerable concessions to the Republic. The Doge was granted the new hereditary title of Protosevastos, making him the fourth in imperial seniority. The Venetians were granted gold, honors, and several churches in the empire. Shops, houses, and three landing stages were granted on the Golden Horn, and all Venetian traders were exempt from customs duties and sea taxes. In return, Venice was to answer when called upon and defend the Adriatic border. This caused a drastic shift and would spiral out of control as Western trade colonies drove the local merchants out of a job. In our next episode, we'll continue building up to the First Crusade, and we'll show how the Eastern Roman Empire situation became direr, and explain what was going on with the Seljuks. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.